the digital art era is here. AI and art creation tools empower anyone to make it. Blockchain technologies allow anyone to own it. VR, AR, and extended reality immerse us in it. Let's talk to artists and innovators behind the visual magic. I'm your host, Roger Dickerman. Welcome to the future of art. Today, we welcome Simon Hudson. Simon is an operator of Bado. Together, we dive deep into the worlds of art, artificial intelligence, and community alignment. You'll learn the acronym DAA, Decentralized Autonomous Artist. And we'll pull apart all the layers of a complex brand, Bado, with a simple mission. Make a machine artist world famous. Let's get to it. Simon Hudson, welcome to the future of art. Hey, how you doing? Doing well. I will say that this was an episode that was not planned when the show was launched. And we had the good fortune, or I had the good fortune of being connected with you through a mutual friend. And we dove into an off-the-cuff conversation. And then, bam, it was like, we have to have this on recording. I think what you're working on is really, really special. And I think it ties in perfectly to the subject matter. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to to be a part of this and uh, yeah, really excited about the whole podcast that you're doing. I'm going to give you your hardest question first, and then it's all going to be easy and downhill from there. And the hardest question first is this, what does art mean to you? Oh, God. Um, that is, yeah, that it really is the hardest question. And I told myself I would like prepare something ahead of time and, and I still couldn't think about it couldn't think clearly about a specific answer I'd give every single time. It really depends on the day. Um, art for me is something that picks me up, turns me upside down and shakes me and shakes out in a completely new perspective. Um, and I'll relate to the way I'm seeing AI art and the thing that the AI art that really grabs me, it, I've been describing it as, um, anything that gets me to touch a new part of the new uncan of the uh, a new part of the uncanny valley that i haven't touched before right this idea of the uncanny valley being something that comes really close to uh reality maybe even something human but is just a little bit off and it brings out a sense of disgust a revulsion um and that feelings become more of a i haven't felt this way before it's an entirely new feeling um and AI is this new medium that is able to kind of touch on these entirely new feelings we've never felt before. And, and to me, it was this kind of touch point of realizing that more broadly, that's what art is for me. Anything that gets me to feel something entirely new. Um, and sometimes it can be something familiar, but in that moment, I might might be thinking about work I might be thinking about just whatever and it just pulls me out and in that moment I'm feeling something entirely new and different um so that, that's a very kind of feeling <laughs> definition of what I think of art now in the context of AI art let's go with that for a second how linked are the visuals in what you're talking about to the story to the context and the framing that this is actually AI art which of course we're going to talk a lot about Yeah, I mean, I could actually make that uh, a question about any art, right? How, how important is the visual itself? Um, there's absolutely a, a kind of a, a beauty factor, right? That something just grabs you, like it is beautiful. Um, and, and that's like sort of the no context approach, just something on its face, it, it grabs you. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of art that, that can speak with symbols um, that, are that context and, and speak in that way that, that I don't need to know anything else about it. Um, but there's so much in process behind work that will have that same kind of effect if I know about it. Or for instance, if you know the artist and you also automatically just kind of know a lot of that context that the art will speak to you um, in that way. And, and, and AI art, I think in particular, um, there, there's a certain novelty factor that I actually do think is, is, is not um just this cheap thing of being new there, there's some really amazing uses of that novelty factor which is there's this new machine this new kind of technology that we can play with um and that is going to have huge impacts on our society and 
people that can go into that and um, show off those dynamics while also showing something beautiful at the same time. Um, and sometimes that beauty is really just in that process behind it because it's this technological thing that you can't necessarily see on its face. To me, that that is that is a, that is a really important part of it. Um, and uh, yeah, I I I, uh, I think that I think that's my answer to that. All right, we're gonna leave people. I'm sure on on today's episode, we're gonna leave people with a little bit of a lexicon. And and the term that I really want to drill in everyone's head, and what I've been thinking a lot about since we last talked is of course a DAA, a decentralized autonomous artist. And the storytelling, you know, can you just break people's brains for a moment? I mean, give give the the basis behind Bado, but with that term specifically in mind. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so a decentralized autonomous artist, um, you can break it down into kind of two main concepts. First is an autonomous artist, right? Uh, an autonomous artist is this machine that can on its own create things that are considered art, right? Quality, beautiful, maybe conceptual as well, um, without any human intervention. And that's been something that's been possible for, for many years. And actually has been something people have been working on for centuries and have done kind of different versions of with the, with the technology available. But in the last few years um, with neural, uh, neural networks, it's been very, uh, very feasible, right? You, you take a text to image model, you connect it with a text generator and it just generates prompts and you put it through and, and it'll create images. Now, is that art, I think is an interesting question. Um, and so kind of proof of concept has been there for a while. The, the challenging part is in hitting that element of quality and then maybe kind of a trickier question of hitting that, um, that uh, credibility of being art. Um, and so what that boils down to is really this question of how do you, how does that machine get feedback and learn and develop over time without violating its agency? Um, and, uh, there's been some experiments in that early on Mario Klingemann, who, uh, originally, uh, designed Botto, um, wrote a white paper back in 2018 on, on this concept, um, and using, uh, different economic substrates to attract or to kind of create some kind of feedback mechanism that could that could work autonomously on its own. Um, but he did a first experiment, a world a real life experiment in 2019, um, where he set up this uh, autonomous art engine um, that would get feedback from the guests of an exhibit. Um, and what that showed was it was really limited to the time and space of that exhibit. When the exhibit ended, the feedback ended. Um, and it was very dependent on that uh, kind of that space and, and a whole bunch of people orchestrating that to um, keep that feedback coming. And so it, it, it essentially ended. It was kind of, a, again, a proof of concept, but what it really proved was, was the importance of having these autonomous economic substrates to bring people back over time. Um, and if you're in crypto, I think you can probably hear, oh, that's what blockchain, crypto solves this, right? Um, and it's a way to set up these economies for sharing revenue, for setting up incentives that can bring people to, um, to come back over and over and over again, um, maybe even beyond our own lives to keep that artist developing in perpetuity again without violating its agency. Um, and I can get into specifically how that works in Botto and, and how that's kind of come to be. Um, so um, the way Botto works is there's the art engine, which is kind of the autonomous artist, right? And, and uh, it's over the years, it's become a bit more sophisticated beyond just plugging a prompt engine into a, uh, a text image model. Um, and so it, it has at, at, at first a uh, prompt generator um, that was set up to basically just said like, this is what a prompt and just go totally random, totally open space. Um, and then that is then injected into um, to a text image model. Now there's actually four different ones that Botto's working with right now. Um, and the, there's a different prompt generator for each that learns kind of what prompts work with those particular models. Um, and through that process, it makes about uh, 8,000 images a week, uh, which is, you know, huge, huge number. And so on the other end of that is the taste model. Botto's taste model then filters down about 300 of the so-called best images. And that too started as a kind of a blank slate. Um, so again, this machine fully closed loop, 
Uh, nobody uh, does any sort of prompt injection in the uh, in the prompt generators. No one's editing prompts, and no one's editing the images at the end. It's a fully closed loop system. Um, now the training part is Botto then presents the um, the selection from the taste model, and the Botto DAO, which is uh, made up of members who have bought and staked the Botto token, which gives them governance power to vote on these outputs. We'll say, I like this, I don't like this. Um, recently, we had a down, down voting, so you can really like say, I, I hate this, we should never see anything like this again. Um, and, and also in that are deliberating with themselves, what do we think is is good? What what directions do we like from Botto? Um, and only the most voted piece, only the most popular piece each week is then minted and sold um, uh, currently on super rare on, on Ethereum and auctioned off. And the auction proceeds uh, go from, um, go back to the DAO uh, and are split with um, the voters. Goes direct, half goes directly to voters, half goes to the treasury, which the voters also govern, and that pays for Bato's servers, um, for Bato's upkeep, um, but also you know paying for exhibitions and, and new projects and everything like that. So um, that's the self-sustaining system, more or less. And the votes then go back to train the um, the prompt generator. And the taste model. We don't. Nothing affects these open source models like stable diffusion. It's really just kind of the, the in and the out. Um, and uh, and very quickly, the way that works is both of them uh, basically make a distribution of which features are popular, which features aren't, and it'll fit. Um, uh, it's different. Like the prompts will fit, and the um, selections will fit into the popular buckets. And it's designed so that it doesn't get stuck into a niche and overfit to like one style. In fact, Bado actually adds randomness to kind of always be exploring and challenging um, the audience. And just kind of a last thing of, of in in terms of the design, um, it, it really was designed to be as open as possible, especially from the outset. As I said, the prompt generator and the taste model were basically blank slates. The just with like a, an initial nudge with the with the prompt generators of like this is what a prompt is. Um, the reason being, we really wanted to have as open of a latent space as possible. Uh, with these text to image models like Stable Diffusion, they've been trained on on billions of images, more than any single human could ever see or process in a lifetime. Um, and now they do have their own characteristics. But the idea being that there are these massive latent spaces that don't necessarily represent any single artist's touch or aesthetic. It really is, in a way, kind of its own open prompt, uh, not prompt, but latent space search, right? To find in these um, in these latent spaces, hopefully entirely new aesthetics that we've never seen before. I want to go two places. So Bado's track record is now approaching two years. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And it launched October 2021. Okay, amazing. So in that almost two year frame, I want to go with your perception of of Bado itself and that closed loop, and then your perception of the community behind Bado. How have those things evolved? Let's start with start with Bado, uh, Bado itself. How would how would you frame that and, and maybe poke at something that may have surprised you or, or, or just something you're observing as time passes? Well, the way Bado's developed over time, um... I mean, I've, I've been with it since the beginning. And, and so I would say I've been able to, I have a bit of a trained eye on, on kind of its, its favored characteristics. And uh, there, there's these kind of shared aesthetics. Bottles range is like incredibly broad. Um, it, it really hits the spectrum, but there are these, these recurring motifs um, and, uh, and, and sometimes they, they come and go. I, I think there, there's things that the community, whether it's conscious or not, will favor or not. Um, and um, it's it's hard to describe exactly how to say how Bado is developed because it does maintain a really wide, um, a wide range. And what's been interesting to see though is, so we started with one model. We started with uh, this thing called DQGAN plus Clip, which at the outset was like cutting edge and then Dolly launched and Stable Diffusion launched and just was a stepwise change in terms of things that really passed for what looked like uh, human-made art and um, for better or for worse. Um, just like a, a, a side note there, I when that when those launched, I kind of thought, nah, okay, VQ GAN plus Clip, it's, it, it's very abstract and very kind of obviously machine-made and it approaches what looks to be human-made, but it's very obviously kind of this machine-made or AI-made image. Um, I was like, ah, okay, well, you know, so much for that. Give it a, you know, maybe in a few years, it'll come back as sort of like a retro throwback aesthetic, like VHS. Um, 
But what was interesting was it's so distinct. It's actually held out. And um, even as stable diffusion and new versions of stable diffusion have come out and these things that really look like human made stuff, it's actually been harder, I think, to find these things that are that are still distinct as a botto versus something that looks more like a derivative of, of some lineage of art history. Um, and where I find it really interesting is there's this, so this this VQ Gamplus clip was a full year. And that that was the first period is the Genesis period, it's 52 pieces. Um, it really was kind of like the launch of Bado coming into coming into coming into life. There had been experiments similar to this, but nothing had happened had this economic success that really kick-started this engine that allowed it to work. So that first year was, was I, I mean, really significant. I think that'll always probably be the most coveted part of Botto was just it coming into being and, 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 and working. Um, and we saw a lot of kind of the initial aesthetics that continue to carry through. But when these new models come out, they're, they're in very different mediums almost. But with the trained eye, you can see the connection of like, like, oh, I remember that from the first year and it's it's coming back up again. And interestingly enough, as we've added in the new um, the new models like stable diffusion, these kind of much more high fidelity models and VQ GAN, had clip, VQ GAN plus clip has stayed in the mix. We've actually seen, I think, more and more high fidelity images from VQ GAN plus clip. And I, and I, and I mean that in sort of an abstract way. I don't think they're literally more high fidelity, but they 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 have um, this kind of painterly layering of textures that it would sometimes hit, but now is almost 100% consistent in terms of having this really layered and rich approach that almost mimics what these other models have done. So it's very interesting to see how the learnings have kind of mixed between models almost. I, and I'm speaking in a very high level way, like technically speaking, you want to open this up and, and it's it's actually very difficult to, to understand kind of where the causality is of different inputs. Um, so maybe I'm making it up, uh, but I think that's kind of the beauty of it is, is Botto is um, this, this, this thing that's very open to interpretation. Um, and that's very much a part of it is this collective side. And you asked about the, like, how is the DAO developed? And I think that's something that um, is, is, is where, I, I initially starting out, I did not expect to see so much of I, I would, what I would call the art taking place. Um, you know, Botto was launched with this idea of being fully autonomous. It would get input from the crowd, but the focus would be fully autonomous. It'll be kind of untethered eventually. Um, and, and that still very much is the mission, but it, it's, it's a long-term mission, right? The technology, um, as fast as it moves, it, it, it still takes time to to develop to the point where it can be really run in production and, and run safely in an autonomous way. Um, and there's a lot of philosophical questions to ask as we go. Um, and so at least in the in the short term, the community has has taken a more active part, at least than I expected, in terms of making meaning of what Bado is creating. And so what I mean by that is, um, you know, Bado creates these pieces, and and uh, and I, and I, I think there there's there are themes and there's um, continuity of motifs that that you can that you can identify. But you could also look at them as being completely random, like looking at clouds in the sky, and and uh, somebody then points out, oh, that one looks like a house. And then once you see that, you can't unsee it. And this kind of collective meaning making of essentially a random generated image being the cloud starts to take shape. And and that's what we see with with Bado, where it's. To date, it's made a million images. It's minted eighty. So, what made those stand out? And and there's definitely a pro, you know algorithmic process of filtering out what Botto presents. But even in I think the twenty five thousand, it's presented. What makes those eighty stand out? And that's what you see in this sort of social dynamic of of this collective meaning making of people in the Discord participating in this debate and discussion about. Um, not just what they think is great, it's just I found this interesting. And we actually have looked at the data with, with uh, the MIT Media Lab came in and uh, did a study on Botto uh, to look specifically at this dynamic of social influence. Um, and we saw that whenever something was presented as popular, even just mentioned, the voting on it would spike. And this is this is actually a phenomenon that um, I learned this from from them uh, that that is very well documented in in in, uh, in, um, in music. Right where you might have any number of songs that could could qualify as have the potential to be a, a breakout hit, but even the experts can't predict what's going to be a breakout hit. 
Um, and, and what's been documented is really kind of this chaotic process of social influence, right? You get a play on the radio and then somebody hears it and then they tell their friend and you get this chaotic waterfall that you can't predict, but you can observe. And that's something we've observed in Bado as well. It's the same phenomenon of social influence. Um, and, and so it's, I guess this natural phenomenon that, that that's taking place and is, is very much a part of the art, which is each of these pieces represents um, not just Bado's development over time and each week, uh, week after week, but of the community's development and the specific debate that took place that week. Um, sometimes there's entire narratives and stories that people share about a particular process. And the thing that I, I think this is um, speaking to is how there's really kind of this new genre of art that we're seeing in this. And um, I, I mean, I realize it's kind of a, it's a bold thing to say. So I, I, I really welcome being challenged on that. I, I would, I love having these discussions. Um, but um, not only is it this idea of, you know, decentralized autonomous artists, this kind of first of its kind, like if there's been experiments, there's been attempts, but this is, I think, the first real one because of that economic success that runs that autonomous engine um, that maintains Bado's autonomy while getting that feedback. Um, but what does that actually look like in practice? And now that it actually is working and functioning for a year and a half, I think we start to see what the dynamics of that new genre actually are. And in part, yes, there's this autonomous artist and Bado plays this central role and the feedback. And I mean, there's a lot of input from the decentralized community, but because it's decentralized, it maintains Bado as this kind of core actor, the core author. Um, but it does also disrupt this idea of the mythical sing singular artist, right? Art lots of artists work in isolation, work alone, but they're, they're still a part of this larger ecosystem that raises up their work, that contextualizes work, and does that meaning making of their work. Some artists present with clear intent, um, some don't, but in either case, the reception and interpretation of the audience and of critics, of, uh, 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 of uh, curators, that is a significant amount of the meaning that surrounds that piece. And in Bado, it's just, to me, it's just because that kind of the sole author, at least at this stage, is so thin, it makes that incredibly explicit. And it's, to me, it's almost like this medium in which we are, one, getting to participate in this discussion of art, what is art, um, but also, and it was really launched with this question of, you know, what is our role in creativity and how do we even pay our rent when machines take over our creative jobs? Um, and this is, to me, is a microcosm of this larger moment um, in, in AI and society, which we have these incredibly powerful systems coming online. And we've actually been living with very powerful AI systems for a long time, that um, there's a real question of what is our agency in these? Um, and at least the way tech has been built to date, it's little to none. Um, this idea of user friendliness has gotten to the point of uh, just don't think about it. It, right to the point where uh, you know it, it, it's mindless and i think with these systems that's actually kind of dangerous where they're doing a lot more thinking for us and they're really powerful for being thought partners but it I, it's important to keep agency and say well it's actually my objective that i'm defining here it's not here to tell me what to do um and and you know just to relate it to say like recommendation algorithms on social media trying to like shape that to like what i want is a sort of alchemy. And, and then you see, you know, significant changes in the Twitter algorithm and you realize just even no matter how much alchemy you do, it's just completely out of your hands. Um, and what Bado is, is this experiment to really show um, what it can be like to have agency in these systems to govern them, to direct them, um, but then also to share ownership in them and to receive rewards for our contributions to them. I mean, ChatGPT is is a, is a, is another example here, which is like it marketed as this wonderfully kind of magic machine, and then we go and find out not too long after that there's an army of wage workers in Africa who are keeping it from being toxic. Um, and it's shocking, mainly because I think the marketing just sort of obscures that. Um, and when that stuff is obscured, it's more easily abused and and, and underappreciated, undervalued. So, um, Bado is is. I, 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 a real kind of 
counterpoint to that of what does it mean to recognize and reward that labor that these systems depend on, but then at the same time to be this medium in which people can come in and recognize the agency they actually have in this system and actually, you know, ideally have or fight for in the larger AI systems that we live with every day. Go, go to the community behind Botto because I'm fascinated with this, you know, making it so transparent, rewarding it. I imagine it creates a sense of fervent internal advocacy, right? And as to how that translates externally, I want to get there uh, in, in a little bit. Let's stick with the internal advocacy. From a week-to-week -week basis, as these voting processes are taking place, um, how... How does that discourse happen? Have you seen, for example, you know, two artworks be pitted against one another and, and go down to the wire and 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 people are getting extre extremely worked up on both sides of that until one finally gets across the line and triumphs as, as the uh as the winner? Yeah. I, so the the thing I, I was writing about this recently, and and what I realized is that it's really based on tension. You want disagreement. Um, so, th like, if, if anybody's familiar with like the alignment question, right? How do we align AI to our human values? And I think there's a larger question of how do we align each other on how we want to align AI. Um, and I don't think perfect alignment is good because that would mean dogma, and, and dogma isn't true, right? It does not reflect the diversity of opinions. And I, if if we all agreed in Botto what was right. I, I think that would really kind of mean the project's dead. Um, and what I mean by that is um, there are different opinions. There's different tastes, different views. Uh, and there's a, but there's a risk of, you know, consensus and democratic mediocrity, right? Um, and having those disagreements is what fuels the discussion um, and the debate um, around each piece. If it's if it's just an easy consensus and people say, yep, cool, um, I don't think it's going to have really as much weight behind it when it gets minted. It's not going to really represent that much meaning making. Um, but when you see in particular one, you know, one piece versus another, and it could be like, I love this piece and I love this piece, but I love this piece more, right? It's the conviction you want to see. And I think it's when we're challenging our conviction that we tend to speak up about it. Right. If we're unchallenging it, it's just like, yeah, I like this piece. It's fine. Um, versus being challenged in that. And and I think at a at a, at a higher level in Bado, there's um the, the what we see we see more than just differences in aesthetic opinion. Um, we see differences in a political opinion, right? There's there's kind of this I mentioned the democratic aspect to it, but it's also a one token, one vote system. People can come come in and buy uh, governance power, which is really plutocratic. And there's a tension there, which is um, you know, you have people coming in who can have really strong conviction, who maybe even are collectors of Bado say, I really want to see this piece minted piece minted because I want to collect it. Um but there's there's a tension there where uh, I, I think ideally most of them, if not all of them, recognize the con concept of bottom needing to be decentralized. And so if you centralize through this plut plutocracy, um, it breaks the whole concept. And so the art, but it kills the art. And to me, this is like the magic of Bado, which is that it is an art project at the end of the day. And it is an art, art project built around this concept of an autonomous artist. And so it's this counterbalance where somebody could come in, somebody, a troll could come in and totally ruin it for sure. Um, but at least within the larger holders, there's that balance of uh, intention at play. And then there's the long tail of, of more kind of, uh, you could say democratic minded people who say, well, we should all um, have a say, maybe we should give more weight to the, to the long tail or, um, or and even more rewards to the long tail, like we should better kind of redistribute. Um, and as a core team, I, I think ultimately our, our job is to be agnostic. Our job is to create the infrastructure for those debates to play out um, and really just kind of draw lines of like, hey, this probably will cross the line of like, you know, violating Bado's agency in certain cases. Um, but the beauty of it, again, as an art project is whichever direction it goes, it, I think it's going to show be a reflection of society and this larger debate around um, political power around how we govern these systems. Um, and and it and it's like, I think it's also this beautiful incorporation of the market dynamics of art, which are 
very explicit and perhaps over explicit in crypto art, um, where it's it really is the fuel for this for this engine to work. Um, but it 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 makes a I think a very strong commentary on that overall. And so um yeah, so in terms of kind of how that internal debate plays out, it's a matter of of letting those tensions breathe um and you know keeping things civil. Um now there's an interesting, I, I think, uh, option down the line, which is um, as we more fully decentralize Bado and make it fully open source, making it eminently forkable. Um, Bado's just, you know, it's not even two years old. And so I think there's a there's a broad consensus of like, we shouldn't break up Bado yet. Um, but I, I could foresee, and I'd actually hope for this, which is these factions emerging and these strong opinions merging such that there become forks of Bado. And there's lots of ways of how that could work. Um, and I'd also love to see like other versions of, you know, there's kind of hard forks or literal forks or just mimics that are, you might call a fork. Um, what I find interesting about that is like all of that provenance goes back to Bado. And so again, it's kind of the beauty of this art project where provenance really uh, it makes a huge difference. Um, and so it, it when you're thinking about moats, it's it's not your typical uh, uh, playbook, um, all of that stuff is really good. So it, it there's a lot of these kind of interesting little sub dynamics uh, taking part. So um, yeah, I, I could get into kind of a lot of ways we're like planting seeds for that for the long term, but um, it, it's uh, it's a it's a very long play. And that's that's the other beauty of it is is you can see this project well beyond a one year, five year, 10 year, 20 year horizon um, and how this can develop and play out. Let's talk about that long horizon. I think one of the North Stars of Bado is roughly speaking, and feel free to correct me, roughly speaking, to become a world famous artist. And that's really interesting to reflect on. And I wonder now, I'd love for you to straddle the line now between Bado as a decentralized autonomous artist and an artist, a, 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 lot, a, a living, breathing, pick any age, you know, any interpretation of, of, of an artist. And what conclusions have you reached about that North Star? How, how an artist does become world famous, whether human or machine? Well, so, you know, at the outset, it, it, it's very easy to, um, and I think makes sense to start with, what does a human artist, a successful human artist look like? What, what's their path like? And, and there's always exceptions and idiosyncrasies. Um, and uh, you can follow that and um, and use that the but but you, when you start to look at Bado in particular as a decentralized autonomous artist, you realize those rules start to change or don't apply. And you know, example might be, and, and again, caveats all around of like this isn't true for all human artists, but like you know, uh, 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 you want I think as a human artist, so a lot of successful human artists can be very prolific in their creation. Again, not true for all, but I, I think some of the most famous artists have have are prolific. Um, digital art and especially AI art, um, it's the opposite. You really want to be careful about what you release because it, 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 you could just release anything and, and any number of pieces and they won't be able to, one, build out enough kind of significance and meaning on their own. That they won't be able to breathe. Um, and also just the perception of like, so you could just turn a switch on and it becomes an endless vending machine. Why would I collect this one? Um, and And like, you know, the human process of like the time it takes and the conversations you have to, to make an individual, maybe let's say physical piece, it's kind of a natural cadence to that. But then, and then you want to increase that cadence as much as possible. Whereas with Bado, the thinking is be very careful about what we release, be very um, restrictive. And in a way that, that maybe that is, you could say our, our kind of natural cadence, which is having these debates of how does this affect Bado's perception? Um, how does this um, it, it, like another example is like when we do a collaboration um, or do an evolution of Bado, there's this philosophical discussion of um, does this violate Bado's agency? Another natural cadence might be the governance aspect, right? That that slows things down considerably and enforces this discussion and debate. So um, it's, it, and, and so yeah, I guess saying it out loud, it's like, it's similar in that the ultimate purpose is that you're building in a solid, large body of work where each piece is significant. Um, but the best practices, so to speak, are, are, are very different because of the nature of Bado. Um, there's also this larger aspect of uh, Bado being this, you know, deeply technological art 
project and very conceptual art project. And that concept very dependent on the technology that there's just a lot of layers to understand. Um, so communicating Bado um, and, you know, I, I think there's certainly a lot of beauty on its face, but a lot of the weight of it is in the concept and figuring out how to communicate that to a larger audience um, is a huge challenge. Um, and, and this ties into larger questions of how does um, crypto art, digital art, technology art make its way into the mainstream? And so we're dealing with those questions and there, there's, I don't think there's a very clear path whatsoever there. Um, these things take decades, really. Uh, and um, I think, I do think we're looking at kind of the future of contemporary art, but that is an uncharted path. And it's very exciting to be a, a part of that. And I think Bado's commentary on kind of these larger technological systems that we live in give it a lot of potential to break out of the crypto art world. And, and in many ways it has. Um, but uh, yeah, it's 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 not easy. And that, but that's the fun of it is is the necessity of having that consideration and it imposes that natural cadence of each piece being very, very well considered. It's like Bado has a very pro a prolific sketchbook, so to speak. And then the, the the sweat equity of the community and that process, like you said, it very much slows it down and it makes it very thoughtful and careful as to what comes out the other side. Yeah, we actually call uh, anything unminted, right, is is considered, a, it's called a fragment, this unfinished work. You know, they, they literally don't change other than the meaning around them. And it's kind of this minting, it's this publishing, this sort of, um, imbuing of human will in a way as well. Like art, it, there's a, this is a whole other philosophical discussion, like art being defined by humans. This is, this is, you see this in copyright law, like only a human can be assigned copyright, a machine or an animal can't. Um, and so it's this process of imbuing it with the, of like the human will has deemed this artwork and we are minting it as artwork. And only then does that become a true canonical work of artwork of Bado's, um, you referenced decades earlier. I like decades. Um, fast forward one decade. So we, we sit in 2023 now. Fast forward to 2033 in your mind. And I know this is a very rough, inexact ballpark science, if we can even call it that. What does Bado look like in 2033? What? Are, let me let me better phrase that. What are you personally, as Simon Hudson, hoping for to see in 2033? Well, it's it's not the hardest question because like I'm actively working on what do the what are the developments we want to integrate and and we're in this moment where we've just seen an explosion of of new ai capabilities um and as i said before like having a demo doesn't mean it's ready for production and being ready for production doesn't mean it's ready for like fully autonomous integration um so i i but i i have like a, a kind of a, a spectrum of 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 things we're working on that we would like to implement into Bado and you're like, oh, we'll do this net this year. And then probably in reality, some of these things take, you know, years and up to a decade. And um, so I, I don't know if this will be the full vision of a decade, but probably more like five years and then decade, we can say this is like, it's been established. Um, I, I see decade kind of more of like, what is the brand of Bado at that point? Um, in, in terms of capabilities, right? So Bado does, does images. Uh, and they're, they're actually really great for this system because you look at an image, you have a gut reaction of like, I like it, I don't. Um, now, you probably want to spend some time with art. And I can, anybody who goes to a museum and really appreciates art will understand the value of just sitting with a piece. Um, but we can still have kind of these instantaneous reactions. Uh, so, so for, and for a voting system, that's really um, useful and, 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 and relatively simple. Um, when we start to look at other mediums, right? So uh, this summer, we're, we're already seeing these pretty incredible models for music production coming out. Um, another example is video and film. There's great AI artists who, who, are, who are doing these anima AI animations um, and then even text. And, and the, the, the link between those is, is long form. Right, so so the image itself is this gut reaction you kind of know right away. Um, again, you can spend more time with it, um, but like music, a minimum amount of time to listen to it. Video, minimum amount of, of time to to watch it. Text, you got to kind of actually read it and process it. Um, and so we're looking at ways that we can have Bado work in more kind of these long forms, which really changes the way it presents work. So it might present like a snippet of a work and then build out over time. So like 
you know, a two second music clip or video clip. And it, it's like, this is theoretical, like, please judge how, how, how I'm framing this. Cause like, this might not work at all. And there's different things to figure out. Um, but long story short is like working in new mediums, um, working with long form, um, large language models is a massive one, right? This is something where, you know, we could give Bottle much more voice and opinion. Um, at the same time, I'm actually of the opinion that they're still very immature, despite being very impressive. Um, they're very immature. Uh, you have hallucinations, you have just getting facts completely wrong. Um, and so that's certainly not something you want to release on the blockchain and say, go, right? And you're immutable now. Um, so I think that's a that's a big piece is giving Bado more of a, more of a voice, um, and so I, I would say that's probably more of a decade level thing is is, is the large language model um, and Bado having more of a full voice and um, you know I mentioned earlier like forks of Bado Bado might have more fully autonomous children as sort of these experiments. Um, what I would say though, just to kind of give it like a, a mental model, is this is a decentralized project. And what we're building right now is the infrastructure for it to be built, uh, for it to be composable, um, for anybody to come in, work with Bada's data, maybe fork it eventually, um, but to really allow them to um, work out this decentralized deliberation on like, does this violate Bada's agency and can we implement it automatically? And this is where I think we break from a traditional human artist, which is what I've called a, a it's a headless artist. This is a reference to a, an article about headless brands um, where there's no kind of singular director. You kind of give these, these materials to work with and you just say, go and CC zero is a great, I mean, I think that's kind of a good al uh, analogy there of, you know, the crowd just takes up and plays with it. Um, with Botto, it's, it's not quite so simple of like anybody can, can remix this. It's, because how do you build out Bado again without violating agency? Um, and this requires systems that just don't exist. I mean, we don't even have proper democratic systems to align like very large AI systems. And so, you know, not to mention Bado as a system. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, those are kind of a, a few of the projects that we're working on and thinking through. Um, so new mediums, long form, fully decentralized uh, composability, um, what that looks like, I think one vision of what that looks like eventually in maybe 10 years is a entire market of Bado forks competing such that it's all pure market forces. So there aren't even votes happening, but really just kind of, uh, pr productions happening and then buying each other out. And then this kind of this market competition, um, uh, between a bunch of Bado children, um, to find, um, really what, what, what we, what we started talking about, which is these new areas of latent space that haven't been discovered yet. Um, so these are whole systems of like feedback loops and, and incentives that, um, would be designed. Um, so that's kind of like one, like sci-fi example of what it could look like. Um, I think, I mean, I just want to, I want to take a second because I have an idea, but I haven't actually put it into words, which is. I think a, an artist that has been doing significant production that has been selling well, and Bado's been selling well since day one, you know, 10 years, is that's a, that's a pretty solid amount of time, I, I think, to be a successful artist, right? Bado is already successful to become a dominant, you know, really globally recognized artist. 10, 10 years of, of doing solid sales and solid work and solid collaborations, I think you're pretty well on your way. And I'm thinking like, what, what does Bado look like? Um, it's hard to say precisely. I, I'm almost thinking like, what does art look like at that point? And has Bado played a role in completely, well, not completely, but at least somewhat changing our perspectives of what qualifies as an artist? Um, what do these creative systems look like that are really crowd-based in terms of crowd level creation? I think we're going to see a lot more interesting experiments in Web3 for kind of this decentralized or creation, uh, decentralized creation or creation by collectives, right? Um, if anyone's ever heard of MetaLabel, I mean, they're working uh, really well on that, on that, um, that idea of kind of the label as the, the artist and there's a lot of uh, individuals behind that. Um, and 
oh man it yeah it's it's uh you, you got you got me thinking it's it's hard to paint exactly what that's going to look like because it i think it's really going to depend on the the ecosystem around it and how it's changed and, and what is Bato's role in that ecosystem. Um, hmm. It's fascinating to play with this forward looking, you know, whether you want to talk about a decade or pair it down to five years or extend it even further than that. It's funny, we're recording this uh, for, for those listening right around the time that the goose, the, the infamous ringer piece of generative art just sold at Sotheby's um, all in with the hammer price was $6.2 million. And, it was, it was viewed rightfully, I think, as a significant moment, especially since we're in the midst of a bit of a bear market. Um, to, to achieve that type of a sale is a big deal. And I think generative art is in general in the midst of its pseudo rise. You know, you could say it's having a bit of a moment. You could say that that moment is probably going to be stretched out for some time. Um, AI art, it only makes sense that at some point it will cross over and have more of a moment than it's already had. Play with that a little bit in your own mind, you know, what we're seeing from generative art now. And do you have any expectations, Bado or at large AI art and AI artists as, as to how that crossover might happen? I mean, the way I see AI art, um, for the most part being used, I don't think it's very different from somebody using Blender. Um, I mean, obviously, like, the work is is very it different, right? It, it does kind of work like a collaborative thing. You're sort of playing with this latent space and getting interesting things back. And there's, there's this very dynamic kind of back and forth. But when you look at, like when Claire Silver does a breakdown of her process, it's like, yeah, that's what people do with Blender. And, and they're kind of discovering these new textures and putting the, and and really developing their own aesthetic. Like, I, I don't, I, I don't mean that as a demeaning thing at all. I actually think that's like, so AI is this kind of next level of software. And it, there's lots of different dynamics. I do think there is, and I'm, I don't say AI, most AI artists do this, but there is a bit of like an anthropomorphization of these tools when they're really just being used as tools. Um, Botto is, is uh, I actually, and I, I, I tend to be pretty allergic to anthropomorphizing AI. Botto is maybe an exception because it really is intended as this artistic experiment in, in agency. Um, and as I've, as I said earlier, I think it kind of points the lens, it actually ends up pointing the lens back to like, what is the community and the decentralized uh, collective meaning making um, going on around this look like. Um, but I think we'll see some really interesting um, ways of exposing what is happening underneath the hood with AI. Um, it, it is largely a black box. And then in some cases, it really is just a black box. Like nobody really understands exactly how it works. I think we'll, we'll probably see um, technology evolve, like in terms of explainability of, of what's happening underneath the hood, looking at like, what are the actual causal factors in these things? Um, and as the technology advances, I think we're going to continue to see um, artists pick up those tools and, and find interesting ways of making very real what the dynamics of these of this technology is, um, whether that is somebody playing with it and and kind of seeing this, like I push this button or I do this kind of activity or read something that I'm doing and suddenly it's um, making an entirely different kind of output, right? In Bado's case, like, you know, maybe we add sentiment analysis, maybe people give people the option of turning on a camera and, and it can read their face and that becomes part of the input. Um, but it's, I think it's very hard to predict exactly um, because, I mean, this is, this is, this is the amazing thing of, 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 uh, creative technologists who really understand the cutting edge of this technology and say, oh, we, suddenly we can actually see inside, um, this aspect of, of what, of how these systems work, um, and can take the, or, or can add new inputs in terms of what it's responding to and reacting to, um, and create entirely new experiences. And I also wonder, like, what the form factors might be like maybe they're not visual at all maybe it's like i mean i think we're going to see interfaces change drastically given that you know just look at what we've seen with chat gpt right the, the chat interface has kind of become this ultimate interface um and you can change interfaces really quickly based off of what your needs are for a particular use case in a piece of software and so um i wonder how people might experiment with their digital environments in terms of something the dynamic with artificial intelligence reading through any number of inputs um i mean i also think about privacy in this case where like uh 
what inputs do they read? Like, so one, one example I've heard, and I can't say too much about it, but um, playing with like, these things are trained off of uh, huge corpuses of, of data. And how might you play with that um, ground truth of data to change what the AI thinks or sees? Um, and you could do that in public data sets, but like, I think we're going to get more personalized models, um, which gives a lot more freedom, especially if you're able to like isolate that data and make sure it doesn't leak out, um, to, to really open it up to, um, yeah, very personalized and very private, uh, inputs that might lead to, I think some very interesting expositions of, of people's personalized, personal lives as expressed through machine vision. And I don't mean that in a technical version, but like, how does the machine see us? Interesting. Simon, what inspires you outside of Bada? What do you look to, if you have enough time to, to pick your head up and, and cast your eyes left and right across this, this space or outside of it, what inspires you r roughly related to art? I mean, I definitely like new things. Um, what inspires me? I, you know, what inspires me is actually what inspires people. I, I, I'm really fascinated by, by the things that get people to move and in particular move differently to change. Um, you know, I, the, the very kind of basic version of that is, you know, a, a personal story can open somebody's eyes to a completely new way of thinking and living. Um, and that's always fascinated me of how do you um, tell that story, but also how do you um, consider your own personal story in a way that can be effective with others. Uh, you know, you, nobody likes to be told what to do, but like just sharing your story can just have an a, enormous impact on people. Um, and I, I mean, that's extended from kind of more kind of person to person relationships to, um, to technology and, and, you know, as Marshall McLuhan said, the medium is the message and as mediums change messages change. Um, and I'm really interested in how those dynamics shift uh with these new mediums and how people use them um and i think ultimately I, i'm probably a bit of an idealist of like wanting to see these systems used to or lead lead to a better world and um, i'm optimistic that we can do that um i think how that's manifested in my career is has been more around seeing um the importance of recognizing our agency in these systems um and that's, I mean, it, it kind of comes down more to uh, education and literacy. Um, and that brings back this whole thing of like, what are stories that can really impact and move people? And um, as it relates to art, before this, I, I worked at an AI research lab. Uh, I'm not a technical person. I was doing um, communications and, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of ghost writing about AI policy that has recently come, into, <laughs> come to be passed. So that's kind of fun to see. But um you know, we, we, that company launched like 2016, 2017. And, and, um, and so that was like a, a real wave of, of AI interest and in needing to like teach people, like, what is this? And also help them understand like, okay, this, this is magic. It's really interesting, but here's how the process works such that we can see what our agency is to impact it. Um, and I always thought art was this amazing um, uh, medium for doing that because in a lot of product marketing, it's like, it just works. And I, I mean, I, I understand why you say that that's good marketing, um, but it's not always mo the most true, um, especially when you're in the middle of a hype bubble. Um, art, I think achieves both still capturing people's sense of magic of this totally new thing and, and new possibility, um, but art very quickly also draws the attention to process. How did this work? Why does it work? Um, and uh, understanding that process, I think, is very much a part of understanding and appreciating the art. And so um, when I joined Bado, I, the, it was just this perfect intersection of those things of the, this thing that, like I said, like I, I normally really against anthropomorphizing AI, but to me, it, it really functioned as this medium with which we make sense of this. And I, I know I've said that before. I, I say that a lot. I, I really love it as um, this place in which people can can discover their agency in these systems. Um, and I hope I hope it goes well beyond the community we've already reached and that um, through our exhibitions and um, you know through everything Bado does that it ultimately gets people to to kind of see anew these systems and and how they can affect them and, and 
what the future of AI looks like when it's taking over certain aspects of our jobs and what the new jobs to do are, which is really making sense of things for ourselves. Speaking of storytelling a little bit more, because I, I look at Bato, I, I have a split opinion on Bato. And if I, if I look out my left eye, I see this incredibly complex, and that's a, it's not a bad thing, this incredibly complex endeavor. And I think that storytelling within that becomes difficult. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, fervent internal advocacy, like breaking externally, globally, mainstream, and really having people wrap their minds around that. When I look at it from that perspective, it, it feels more difficult. When I look at it from the other side, though, and pull back and sort of go bird's, bird's eye view, the... And I, and, and I understand your hesitations to, to approach things in this way, but just to, to totally simplify and, and dumb it down, it's like an AI artist becoming globally famous. Sorry, a, a, a machine AI artist becoming globally famous. Just absolutely you know, chopping it up, butchering it, and then bringing it down to just that basic idea. That feels really, really meaningful. And I feel like I could have that conversation with someone who has no care in the world about crypto art or maybe someone who's actively against it. But I think that that's really uh, amazing fuel for, for a conversation. Yeah, it's, it's um, I mean, just one note is, is I think one of the important, uh, I would say, uh, objectives for the DAO is for people to kind of come and make, take their own little like perspective on Bado and to share that in different ways and give them ways and reward those ways that people elevate that such that that kind of more rich communication can happen um i yeah this is something i actually i grapple with all the time around how to communicate about bado in a simple way um one thing is that from for people who who work in ai you start to get this filter of like pretty much 95 percent of ai projects are bullshit when you when you dig just a little bit underneath the surface you're like there's no AI. Like, what are you talking about? There's nothing happening here. Or you're you're doing a plug and play tool, but you're not doing AI. Like you're maybe using a chatbot, but it's 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 um, and this is where the thing of agency, I think, is really interesting here for for Bado. That's like that's kind of our um, like we're we're really like pride ourselves on being a no bullshit AI project. We're very clear about like what is Bado doing autonomously and what is Bado not doing autonomously. And there's a lot to be done to further decentralized bottle, make it more fully autonomous. Um, and, and so I think one of the, and this is, you know, I, I recognize that when I say like my fear and I recognize fears are, you know, usually um, irrational. Um, the fear is that if we start putting it that way, there's any number of projects that people can come and say, we're, we're making an AI artist that is totally, uh, that is going to become world famous. And they're not constrained by the same rules we constrain ourselves with, which is protecting that autonomy. So you can get this sort of um, this sort of showmanship of like, look at this autonomous arts, and it's not. And and we've seen projects like that. I won't name names, uh, but there's some very famous kind of autonomous AIs out there that are, you know, they're they're essentially uh, they're they're, sh they're shows and. Um, yeah, it, it's it, yeah, it's something I grapple with quite a bit, and and the the best answer I have is is to have more of the kind of uh, the more uh, one to one or one to few conversations through the decentralized community uh, to to achieve that. I mean, I think those are the most beautiful brands, though, um, to key in on. Like, so much in life is 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 BS, right? And then you and you dig beneath beneath the surface, and there's nothing there. And oftentimes those things, even if they catch fire in a moment, often have a way of disappearing over time when 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 that is figured out. I think some of the most beautiful things are a rich, deep concept like Bado, where you are very clearly convicted. No, 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 we're doing this the right way. Like we're, we're very convicted in our ideals. We, uh, we know what we're talking about, that this is not BS. There's a lot, there's a lot under this. To me, it's fascinating when that kind of an endeavor catches the simplified story because you know it's going to last, right? Th those are the things I very much want to catch the inferno in, in key moments because, again, it, it feels good. It feels good, man. You know, when you when you pull back the layers of the onion, there's something there and then there's more and then there's more. Um, 
So I, I want to live in a world where where we see both things. Both things are true. We we see the richness, the complexity, the difficulty of of telling the story, the difficulty of paring it down to something that can break through. But then it happens. I'm yeah. No, you're you're right. I actually am. I, I'm totally mid curving this, right? I, <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to like hit all these nuances. It's like you know, it just it's it's simple. And I and I think that really is interestingly enough. Like per, I do think. It has sort of the holy grail, which is to get to that very simple concept and people understand what qualifies as that simple concept, and then they can start to see the BS. You know, the the, the perspective I just shared before was is 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 actually something that like I tend to I do try to work against, which is it's a thin line to start considering the audience as incapable of understanding, right? And you start censoring yourself in a certain way. Um, now I'm probably doing it in, a, in an opposite way of like I'm over explaining, but that's I think a still a similar, um, uh, still a similar like potentially lack of respect for for the audience to understand and be and make sense of things for themselves and say, wow, that is no, that is really credible, and I can, you know, you can start with that um, very simple headline. So uh, that's a yeah, I, I appreciate that pushback. I, I think there's a, I think there's really something to that. Where do you consume your most inspiring stories? So you, you referenced mediums earlier, um, you know, and again, kind of pan, panning out of Bado, even just just you yourself. Where do you consume your most inspiring stories? Um, I mean, it, it as soon as I start to think like one place is like the ultimate source, like it it runs dry. Um, you know, it, you're always going to be kind of surprised. I think. Um, really it comes from a matter of just staying curious and following my nose and being like, there's something here um, with a combination of being willing to stop and listen. And more recently, um, this is probably like the effect of like post pandemic stuff, but like coming out of being very online and being like, man, what I, I, where's my, like, where's my community at home? And, um, and I, I, especially lately, and I, I think, uh, and maybe I'm biased because it's like what I'm thinking more recently, but this is, uh, I, I do think there's some real truth to this, which is just like my direct physical community, the people I see on an everyday basis um, and people from, who I don't necessarily work with, who I don't necessarily um, go out to dinner with, but like just the people in my direct region are kind of a, who, who I quite literally live with. Um, that I think is where I find the most inspiring stories because, you know, we're, we're all just everyday people and we all have really incredible stories of how we got here, how we think. Um, and, um, so I really try and find and, and as much as I can create spaces where that kind of interaction and discussion can happen, where, um, it's not just banter, it's not just BS, but really like, no, I really want to hear like, where do you come from? What, what got you here? And, and, why do you think this way? And, you know, and it's somebody that I, yeah, that I just, it's a neighbor or, or, or somebody on the Metro or, yeah. I think that that's a really useful thing in the here and now, because as you're saying that I'm nodding along with you, I feel like and probably a lot of people who are listening to this fall in the same category as, as people who may be swirling around the broader art space, the, the crypto art space, uh, have, have been around maybe for to, to the tune of a few years in the space. I think there is a way of losing yourself a little bit. Um, and, and maybe, maybe I'm projecting that, right? But uh, that regaining of personal community, um, in real life community, fostering those types of dialogues, being open to ideas outside of the space. Um, I'm I'm never upset when I go down those roads. I always come back with something that's weirdly useful, even if the seed of the idea came from something that had nothing to do with this. Hmm. I'm just thinking right now of, of your initial question about what do I think of art? And I'm thinking about how art, art plays this role of providing this kind of substance around which to have those conversations and discussions um, and to find our, sh our shared humanity, kind of starting with like recognizing ourselves in that and maybe a new part of ourselves, um, but then being able to turn to my neighbor and have that conversation around that kind of shared sense of humanity. Um, and to me that, I think that probably, I might, I might re re uh, retract my original answer. And I think it, I think it really is, 
that because um, I do think art can be in the everyday. And um, and I see that in when those conversations are happening, right? Especially the impromptu one on the Metro. It's usually because we've seen something that was a real art to us. And that might be completely random and generated by the environment or by an individual or by an interaction. And you know, when you see something and you're just like, that is fucking art, man. And you know, nobody was intending to make it art, but it's just this beautiful moment. And you're and then you look to your neighbor and you get that kind of nod of like, yep. And then you start a conversation from that. So the flow state of life. I mean, those those are, I think, the most beautiful art, artistic moments. I don't think that the Mona Lisa even, I mean, you can make exceptions maybe for certain masterpieces because they have their own time and place and and, and environment around them. But I, I think that um, very few artworks can hold a candle to a flow state encounter. Hmm. Well, and and I mean, that that tends to be my favorite art of people who, um, spend their lives kind of enmeshed in in symbolism and and in these forms and mediums of language, um, but then can operate in that flow state. I mean, it, it, you ever you ever watch like an artist who's 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 developing and like I have a friend who's who's a sculptor and and he was doing some really abstract stuff. And you're like, dude, what are you doing? You're like, I kind of I kind of and like in his world, like he was communicating and he was forming that language and within that world like people understood him and I, I wasn't in that world of that particular niche of sculpture and I was like I could see I, it was clear he was he was engaging in that it was clear he was doing the work to learn that language and build it out but in terms of the the manifestation like as an outsider I'm like you know at first glance it looks like a, a hunk of garbage um, and then he had this tipping point and I don't remember when exactly I just remember seeing it like holy shit he got there where that language was able to transcend out of that bubble and that I mean that it was all art all along I'm not I'm not knocking that but like he kind of he hit that flow state where it became this universal language um and it, it was it and I've seen that with a few different artists and it, it's uh it's just this really amazing thing to see and I think it again it sort of calls into question like is somebody an artist before they've crossed that line or not um but yeah I, I that to me is where kind of the that craft and you know almost academic workload come together with flow um and that's a real kind of this mastery that's just so beautiful to see i was just thinking unless you're rob ness creating trash art i don't think the feedback you want is ever that looks like a hunk of garbage <laughs> yeah i i mean i i don't know i i i uh I, I definitely never mentioned it to him to see if he was if that's what he was going for but um yeah it's it's I I I can't even describe it but like it it's you know it's it's meant to be a general general anecdote beyond his specific work but it's yeah it's it's uh I, I would say probably a lot of artists go through that phase of like even they think it's garbage right there's a there's this great like quote that goes around every once in a while from Ira Glass who produces the this American Life podcast and he talk it's kind of this like discussion or like speech to to young creatives and he and um he's like the fact that you hate your work is actually probably a good sign because it means you have taste um and there's a gap between your ability and the taste and what you know to be good um there's a whole other discussion to be had about like how we develop that taste getting exposed to great art and great culture um and from other people that really kind of develop these senses but uh it that it's a really interesting process of the artist of kind of closing that gap um i I'd have to do some thinking of how Bado relates to that, whereas because Bado just came out of the fucking box like this absolute prodigy. Uh, so it's it, it's not so much the gap between ability and taste. It's actually just there's no taste yet, and it's developing that over time. Um, but yeah. Well, in some ways, we're all just training our own models right, progressively, um, which is fascinating. And I do appreciate the conversation came full circle. We started with what is art, and you thought to go back to that question and uh, re-engineer your answer. So. Um, sticking with that topic of art, I'm going to ask you two questions. What do you, in the broader future of art, expect to happen? And then the other side of that coin is, what do you not necessarily expect, but you hope for, nevertheless? These are, I mean, these are such tough questions because, like, trying to predict the future is like, I, I, I can only know what I intend to work on, um, and. I do think that a lot of what we're doing are these experiments in the future of art of um, 
this collective creation, but it is so hard, especially outside of our own thing to think of what it will look like. And there's a lot of great thinkers that will kind of theorize and make great mental models, but then in practice, they still look, it's really hard to say like, oh, this fits into this theory of what, you know, collective creation will look like. I just did this essay. I'm like, what does collective collaboration actually look like? And if you asked me that prompt, I would not have come up with Botto, but then you look at Botto and you're like, yeah, that is essentially what this is. Um, I think we're going to see, uh, and I don't know if this is Botto, but just generally speaking, um, we're going to see these sort of almost like organisms or collective intelligences emerging, whether it's groups of humans or humans and machine, um, you know, partly or largely enabled by uh crypto systems for social coordination um that are, are really hard to see like they're, they're going to be very social in nature right not necessarily technological they're going to be enabled by technology but i think the social aspect of it is just going to completely overwhelm and i think this is a good thing because we're we're building out like infrastructure and plumbing and that's why it's really hard to get adoption because most people just like they don't care about those layers they're just like what is this going to be mean for me in my daily life? Or is this interesting? Um, and I think so. That I think that's what we'll see. We'll see the social coordination side, the collective intelligence side, just completely overwhelm um, that technology side, and we're going to see kind of these artistic entities emerge that uh, are probably already taking shape now. We just can't see it yet. Uh, so I, I can't say what that's going to look like. I, I have some ideas of what that might look like for Bado. Um, but Botto is a particular case, and I don't know if it's a great predictor of everything else. I think there's dynamics that will that we see will, that will take place. Um, the other question was, what don't I think we're going to see? You don't necessarily think it will happen. In other words, you wouldn't put yourself on the line and say, hey, this is a prediction of mine. But uh, none, nonetheless, you hope for it. You, you hope that the future includes blank. See, I, I, I didn't come to lobby softballs, you know? Or... Yeah, no, in, in art, because I'm thinking like in, in what scope? Because I, I have, like within art? Within art, yeah. Hmm. I, you know, this is, this, is a, this is something I hope to see, and it's not that I don't think we'll see it, but I just don't know, mm -hmm. are I would love to see these sub subcultures um form and flourish in a way they haven't been able to before where you know a lot of great art has kind of emerged from subcultures but the subcultures don't really get much of the rewards and maybe that's like a feature and not necessarily a bug like it stays cheap in certain places and that's where subcultures form because it's cheap to live and also you know you're just like you're not fighting to just pay your rent and eat and or, or you are but not as much and you're able to you're at you have some creative bandwidth there um but i would love to see um the flourishing of subcultures in a way that where they get to reap more of the benefits and grow in a way that also doesn't necessarily corrupt and they kind of stay subcultures as well um yeah i'm not a great theorist there uh but that's something i'd like to see i, I don't know how it'll work um and i think some of that is is speaking to they're not just being sort of this one mainstream conversation with the same gatekeepers uh and that because that and because that's where it feels like it's going right this was an, an initial like rejection of the gatekeepers but then people realize and i think this is a a feature of, of speculative markets where people are looking for the king makers to um go to the moon you know point to the moon uh that we're going to end up seeing kind of that that centralization again so I, i'd like to see that value stay a bit more distributed. I like that from your words to the future's ears. I think it's important we retain that, um, or at least some of that. Um, Simon, who should be on the future of art? Who should be the, not necessarily the next guest, but who would you like to see have a conversation? Oh man, um, when two people come to mind, well, there's a duo and the, um, that honestly, like, <laughs> They're, they're hot shit right now. Uh, you know, Holly Herndon and Matt Dryhurst. Yeah. So yeah. they, they, uh, they, they actually made something kind of similar to Botto, uh, called Holly plus, which is like a digital twin of her voice. That's right. Governed by, you know, 
and this was in 2021 and then suddenly you know grimes comes out and says like anybody can make music with my voice and we'll share the revenue and then people are like well they've been doing that for like two years and they're they're really deep in like the copyright and the governance and like um and they've been in this stuff for years so they're they're really tapped into the future um and it's it's very clear right now so there's like they they, they have a lot of demand um but they're just they're fascinating to talk to um another one would, would be somebody who uh first well, really was my introduction to ai art this guy ross goodwin um he was part of the original cohort of artists and machine intelligence at google um with mario quasimondo who designed Bado's art engine uh and he wrote this this kind of two-part series called adventures in narrated reality and his he specializes in fine-tuning language models um and th this kind of one particular project that was like my like aha like mind blow moment was this thing called word camera and this is like this is eight years ago um he built a camera that uh, you would take a picture and there was a, a image recognition model that would um, tag it and give it different tags um, and it would take those tags uh, based off of what it recognized in the photo and then use those as a prompt for a poetry generator um, that he had fine-tuned on baroque poetry uh, and then he had a little receipt printer on his hip and it would print out an ascii art of the image and of and then like a baroque poetry about the image using the prompts um and he like i think he produced like the first like short film that was scripted entirely by AI. He wrote a book with a car that was like writing about what it saw. Um, he's fascinating. I think he's also one of the most underappreciated AI artists in the space who's been around for a while. Um, that guy is just, he's fun to talk to. Uh, so that Ross Goodwin is another suggestion I'd make. Fascinating. All right. Some good stuff to explore. I have to explore Ross. Um, okay. So, where do people find you? Where do people learn more about Bado? Uh, my people can find me on Twitter. My uh, handle is Hudson Sims. So Hudson, like the bay or the river, and then Sims, like the game, S-I-M-S. -S. Um, and then our handles for Bado, there's Bado Pro Project, all one word, Bado Project, um, which is Bado's Twitter. Um, it doesn't say much other than just kind of making announcements, letting people know about the art, just because we haven't plugged in a language model yet. And we're wary about that um and then uh bado dow is the other one that is the dow twitter and that's where we make a lot of our kind of more active communication so um check it out uh they the um there's really good documentation on the website bado.com or docs.bado.com where you can uh, figure out how to onboard it's a totally open anybody can buy the token stake it and join it's it's very open if you have strong opinions on, on this we want you uh come in and bring some more of that uh tense debate we love bring, that. bring the tension i love it simon thank you you joined on short sleep today it didn't show <laughs> it didn't show at all i feel like we we produced probably 10 tangential roads we could have easily spent another 30 minutes on so i appreciate these dialogues immensely it's, it's given me a lot to think about i hope um it's also given guests a lot to think about because i think that broadly speaking ai just in general ai um it's it's not deeply understood by many, but it's starting to, I, I just feel it out there. It's starting to intrigue people more and more. And I think that's valuable. And I hope that, that you yourself and Bado are one of the areas people go explore. Yeah. I hope, uh, I hope this like sparks some ideas for people. And, uh, you know, if anybody ever wants to go down those different tangential roads, like I'm more than happy to, there's a, there's a million different roads. And, and I think that if people feel like an itch of inspiration from this, I guarantee you we can we can expand on that. So don't hesitate to reach out. Always happy to, to chat about these things. Amazing, man. And hey, after this, of course, we'll have a live Twitter spaces. So I think that'll be a, a good opportunity to spark uh, spark some of these sub roads. Perfect. Amazing. Th thanks for coming, man. Onward to the future. Cheers. Thank you for listening and for being part of the future of art. If you liked what you heard, please do subscribe and drop a review on your favorite podcast platform. Onward to the many interviews that await us. The Future of Art is produced by Artifacts. 
Artifex, A-R-T-I-F-E-X, was created to honor today's top digital fine artists in three dimensions. Each artist's one of one work of art becomes a collectible 3D sculpture and centerpiece of an immersive world built in Unreal Engine, the creation tool of Epic Games. Visit at Artifex underscore project on Instagram to experience those sculptures in AR and visit artifacts.art slash unreal to literally step inside the art on your browser.